Hi, everyone. Dr. Tim and Hillary for another Dr. Tim's Aquatics podcast. How are you doing this morning, Hillary? I am doing good, doing good. Finally catching up and recuperating from last week. Just in time to take another trip. What's right? next? <laughs> uh, we've got the Canadian Pet Expo September, um, I think it's the 16th and 17th in Toronto. Is that the one that you are speaking at? Yeah, I'm speaking. Dale, our reptile systems expert manager, is coming out from the from uh, England, and he's speaking too. So Very exciting. If you're in the area, it's going to be a big show. Fish, reptiles for the weekend out by the at the convention center or exposition center out by the airport there in Toronto. It's going to be a lot of fun. Do you want to give the folks a recap of SuperZoo? Right. So we just got back from SuperZoo, which is a annual uh, industry show in Las Vegas. We had uh, our biggest booth ever, 10 by 50 feet. And we showed Reptile Systems, Dr. Tim's, and ASF. And I uh, we entered two point-of-purchase displays. And the ASF point of purchase display won second price, second second place, which is quite. Actually, there were a lot of entries, so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, yes. And it looks really nice showing off the uh, uh, LEDs for freshwater, marine, and uh, reef. You know, those they're 100 blue. The reef are all blue LEDs, plus our new reef evolution sea salt in buckets and boxes and the new pumps. We've got five DC uh, pumps made in Italy along with uh, going to have three wave makers. We have two now third one coming three different sizes of wave makers and three different sizes of the uh, MX pumps. So there's a, all made in Italy, a lot of nice stuff coming out and uh, really big, busy show. A lot of people, and uh, we talked a lot of reptiles, saltwater, marine, freshwater, just a lot of neat things. I got to say, there was also some oddball stuff. The craziest thing I saw at the show, they had ostriches. Ostriches. Baby ostriches for, what, 900 bucks a piece? Yes. And they were sold by the end of the show. Question. What do you do with the ostrich? I have you, no idea. Is, I mean, it doesn't. It's not. A, is it a pet? That beats me. All I can think is because they had farm stuff at the show, that that would have been like if people were trying, I don't know, like um, like tractor supply or something. Obviously, tractor supply is not selling ostriches, but stores like that, maybe. Yeah. Ostrich eggs are supposed to be pretty good for omelets for a whole family. Uh, I don't, yeah, there were a lot of lot of animals this year, a lot of different animals. I mean, fish and reptiles and, and weird things. So it's all good. Yep. A lot of fun. Yes. And lots of puffer fish. Lots I don't think I've fish. ever seen that many puffer <laughs> fish in the show. So Hillary was quite happy, folks. Yes. yes. And then I sent her a link to the Sacramento Aquarium Society poster on puffer fishes. So if you're uh, wanting to know all about types of puffer fish, that's a place to go to check out the Sacramento Aquarium Society. Was it their Facebook page or Instagram? One of those. I think it was their Facebook. A lot of puffers are reclassified slash renamed. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> One but. reason I never learned a lot of those names, because with fish people, they change them every five years. It's like your grocery store. Once you get to know where everything is, they flip flop. All right. Are we ready? Enough, I think so. Questions. All right. Well, today is going to be a question and answer podcast. So, uh, if you're listening, hopefully maybe these answer some of your questions. If you have questions that aren't asked on here and you would like us to answer them, send us a message, let us know. We'll get them on the list for the next Q&A podcast. Starting out, question number one. Which two products from Dr. Tim's Aquatics are used for controlling dinoflagellates? Dinoflagellates, the answer is refresh and waste away. But the big but in this is if your nitrate is below five and your phosphate is zero or your phosphate is zero, one or the other, you've got to get your water chemistry in balance 
before these products are or any product is really going to work because when you have low nitrate and low or absent phosphate basically the only thing that can grow are dinoflagellates you can't grow cyanobacteria because you have no phosphate and you can't grow the waste away or Benef, you know, beneficial bacteria that could outcompete the dinos because they need a little bit of nitrate and phosphate in the water. So how can the dinos grow? Well, dinoflagellates have the unique ability, one, that they're photosynthetic. And what that means, and why that is an indication, if you get up in the morning and you look at your tank and the substrate is you know it's nice it's maybe got a little brown but it's good you the lights come on and then the crud just comes out i mean it's it's like you know the vampires coming out of the cemetery at midnight all of a sudden as the day goes on this crud is coming out of your substrate it's got oxygen bubbles on it and it just is looking worse and worse and worse that's dinoflagellates they're photosynthetic and what they can do is they can break down organics and phosphates love to be trapped on organics. As I've said many times, your phosphate test kit only measures what's called inorganic phosphate or soluble reactive phosphate. That is typically less than 2% of the total phosphate in your aquarium. If you were to take a soil sample and do a total phosphate test, which involves a digestion and, and different things that, you know, the, the, the average aquarist, most aquarists, I, I don't even know that mo public aquariums have the equipment for this because um, you have to do a digestion. You would find that the total phosphate in the system, let's say it's 10 parts of milligrams per liter, your soluble reactive might be 0 0.02, might be zero, because all the phosphate, phosphate's a very sticky molecule, so it sticks to things, and what it loves to stick to is organics. Dinoflagellates can break down those organics and basically extract the phosphates from those organics. Cyanobacteria can't do that, and neither can uh, uh bacteria that live in the water column, like the waste away bacteria, they need phosphate already dissolved in the water to break down those organics to produce more phosphates. So long explanation for question one is that you've got to get your chemistry in check so that you can turn the system from being dominated by dinos to one that can be dominated by beneficial bacteria living in the water column and that means your nitrate needs to be around between 5 and 10 milligrams per liter. And your phosphate should be at least 0.03 to 0.05 or a little higher. Then you would use the refresh, and that will knock back the dinos. And once the dinos have, are, are on the ropes and not growing well and you've knocked them back, you need to then use... Uh, the waste away to get that organic material out of there that the dinos are feeding on any anyways. And in conjunction, what you can do is a good substrate wash, you know, gravel, we call it a gravel clean, but you probably don't have gravel, you probably have coral or sand, clean that. And the other thing we recommend, the primary difference between treating with dinos and sinos is you do a dark phase and you wrap the aquarium, you turn off all the lights you wrap it in black plastic or something so there's no light in there because the that stresses the dinos. No light means they can't do their photosynthesis, and so they can't grow, and that stresses them. And then you're hitting them with the refresh, and that knocks them on the ropes. And, and all this is detailed in a recipe card, and you can go to our site. You can email us, or, but our website, you can go – over to where the literature section is, and you can download a step-by-step, day-by-day recipe card that has all this detailed in there. Yes, perfect. And, I was just going to mention the recipe card. If, you, well, if you're on social media, send me a message. I'll send you a link to the PDF for it. Yep. And even and that, some of the stores are carrying the re like physical copies of the recipe cards. Yep.
Okay, let's move on to question number two. I recently noticed my ammonia would not go below 0.25 while cycling. So I decided to check my tap water after adding first defense water conditioner. And I noticed that my ammonia reading was up to almost one parts per million. After seeing that, I tested my tap water after adding prime water conditioner and read my ammonia to be zero. I don't think it is safe for me to do water changes with water that already contains such high amounts of ammonia. Since first defense seems not to be able to detoxify my water, what should I do? Is first defense not supposed to detoxify my water? Thanks. So um, first defense does not remove ammonia from your water. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't detoxify your water. Ammonia is not the primary toxin in your water. For most people, the primary toxin in your tap water is chloramine, followed by chlorine in some instances. And a one part a million ammonia, two parts per million ammonia is not going to kill it, anything quickly. Your fish your corals, you know, they could live in that, okay? But one, two, three, four parts of chloramines, you're going to kill everything. So your primary toxin is chlorine or chloramines and chlorine, which First Defense takes care of. If you want to get rid of ammonia, we have a product called AquaCleanse, and that will get rid of ammonia just like the prime. But why we generally... Don't recommend that is that in order to take care of ammonia, you want to use the one and only nitri live nitrifying bacteria. People get the one and only, they get the ammonia from us, but then the first thing they do is add prime to the system and then they add the ammonia. Well, the prime detoxifies the ammonia that the bacteria need. So you've just counteracted the addition of the ammonia which is why I recommend you do not add any type of ammonia-removing chemical while you're cycling. The bacteria will take care of the ammonia. You need to get rid of the chloramine and the chlorine, and that's what First Defense does. Plus, it has a lot of vitamins to help with fish stress and some um, buffering agents, things like that. So in short, why does the water have ammonia? So what's happened is that your municipality used chlorine, chloramines to, they put chloramine in the water to keep out bad bacteria, to kill bad bacteria, to make the water safe for you to drink. As that chloramine goes from the distribution plant to your house, it dissociates forming ammonia. And that's where the ammonia is coming from. Uh, or if you're running your water through some type of a water softener or some, some type of a system that has a lot of surface area, you could actually be growing bacteria in that. So that's why it has to be changed once in a while. But one part per million ammonia, while not the best water quality to use, is not toxic. Putting Doing a 10% water change with that water, the nitrifying bacteria in established tank will handle that with no problem. What they won't handle is 10% water change where you're dumping a bunch of chloramine into your established aquarium. So just want to make that clear that First Defense does detoxify and it detoxifies the most prevalent and dangerous toxins in your water, chloramine, chlorine, heavy metals, and things like that. Right. And, and Prime, I mean, there's no reason to use it if you're using ammonia plus People overdose it. They they rely on it too much. I had a public aquarium do this. They bought gallons and gallons of the one and only. And then their staff decided, that, well, we need to add 55-gallon drums. And the problem with the chemical that is prime is that it is a weak acid, which means that it consumes your alkalinity and drops your pH. Well, what happens? When you drop your pH, it's in the... Uh, too low, and now your ammonia is sticking around because most of the ammonia, even in a saltwater tank, is in the ammonium form, which the bacteria don't use. So I'm not saying don't use it, but use it wisely and understand what it does. Yep, exactly. Actually, when I worked at the public aquarium, we were not allowed to use Prime at all because of well, the issues that it caused. Well, your director was smart. 
<laughs> okay, let's see. We're on question number three. Why does one and only have an expiration date and the other products don't? Well, one and only has an expiration date because and, and it the bacteria don't die. What it is, is we don't bottle bacteria until we get orders. And the one and only bacteria. And the nitrifying bacteria don't form spores. So they have an energy cell, the ribosome. And that, when we put it in the bottle, they're not being fed ammonia. They're, they're static, but they're like a fully charged battery. That's the best analogy I use. But even a fully charged battery not being used slowly decays. The battery doesn't go bad, but the charge decays. And so over time, that battery will not perform as well as when you first got it. And that's basically what happens in the one and only. Over time, a year, two years, the bacteria are losing their energy. And so when you go to use it, they're still intact. They're still better than nothing, but they're not going to work as well as if you got, use them right out of the bottle or in the first few months. So that's why we put, we don't put an expiration date. We put a best buy date. You can still use one and only that has passed its best buy date. There's no harm to it. That, like I say, the cells, I mean, I'm having this discussion offline with a person I'm going to do a podcast with, and they found this paper, which um, I don't think I've ever referred to, but this these researchers showed that the cells that can be a year and a half, two years old, ammonia oxidizing bacteria, st start coming back within six to 10 minutes of adding ammonia to the water. That's how they're genetically oh. programmed. There, you know, this is why, and this a little bit of a pet peeve in that people think bacteria are human. They can't, you know, they can't breathe in a bottle. Well, they don't have lungs. You know, they can't eat. Well, they don't eat like we do. They can go very long periods of time without nutrition because all they want to do is divide. If you if the cell maintains its cell shape, it doesn't get poisoned. The cell wall doesn't get broken. The cells last for long, long time. And if you remember, you know, if you got that Big Bang uh, TV show in your in your head, the theme song, they're talking about autotrophs. Autotrophs were some of the earliest organisms on Earth, and those are ammonia nitride oxidizers, which are autotrophs. They've been around a long, long time in conditions that don't always favor them. That's how they're evolutionarily programmed. I feel I like if we were in a classroom right now, like the students would be like, can we watch Big Bang Theory? <laughs> no, get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a better instructor than Sheldon was. He didn't like students. So. No. Okay. Question number four. I have a 55 gallon tank. I poured a full four ounce bottle of one and only in. After adding ammonium chloride three times and with a pH of 8.2 to 8.0, I haven't really seen the ammonia drop much. It has stayed around two to four maybe a little higher. I'm on day eight. Should I add more one and only? Water is perfectly clear and nitrate levels are around two with nitrite staying about two. Perfectly clear water doesn't really indicate much, but you've added ammonia three times. Ammonia is two, nitrite is two, nitrate is two. Well, the first, see, because things are working. Because if you add ammonia three times, that's at least six milligrams per liter. And the nitrite is two and the nitrate is two. So and it, when the ammonia is dropped by two thirds from six to two, my initial reaction is I'd, I'd want to know more about what the media is. Do you have substrate? But I don't know that I believe the readings because the chemistry doesn't work out. Nitrate, though, nitrate test kits, I'm, I'm, as you can see, the wheels are turning in the head here. Um, nitrate at low levels doesn't really, the test kits don't really read very well. So it could be six. Um, that's what I'd expect. It'd be six to 10. 
I mean, the system is working. You have nitrite and nitrate. So I want to know more about water flow and what the media is. Maybe there's maybe this is a bare bottom tank or um, really fine sand, the sugar sand that um, doesn't, a lot of things can't penetrate that. So you don't get good bacterial growth because the nitrified bacteria need surfaces. So that's what I want to get more of. So I'm not sure I can really answer the question at, at some point. Well, I'd probably say, can you get another test kit or can you take the water sample to a store and confirm that your test kits readings are correct? Yep. Check, make sure that they're not as expired. I actually just had some expired test kits that I had to replace. And then it depends on the test kit too. Uh, um, if, if, like like some test kits, the top level is one or two in or two. And if if you're always reading at two, basically you may be off the scale. And so we do a dilution. Take aquarium water, mix it, say 50-50 or one part aquarium water with three parts of like a bottled water, not tap water, because as the previous question, you you can have ammonia in your tap water. So use uh, drinking water, dilute it, and then take the reading. And if you know you dilute it 50-50 and take the reading and it's two, well, that's telling you it's really four, and that's above your test kit um, scale. It's at least four. And if you dilute it one to three, you, you know, one part aquarium water, three parts drinking water, bottled drinking water, do the test, and it's still two. Well, now it's two times four, which is eight. So it's just off the scale. Um, and I bring that up because it doesn't mean the bacteria are working. You have nitrite and you have, so that tells you the bacteria are working, but you've added the, back, the ammonia too fast. Um, and this is one thing we run into is on, there's a recipe card, just like, uh, we have recipe cards for uh, dinos and cyanos. We have a cycling recipe card and it does say add ammonia on day, you know, the first day and then on day three and day five, but there's a little asterisk there. And it says, if your, if your ammonia or your nitrite is still high above, you know, two milligrams per liter, don't add the ammonia. But a lot of people miss that. The card says add ammonia, they add ammonia. So if you keep on adding ammonia, it gets too high and that slows down the process. So it, it you got to let the bacteria, it takes them 24 to 48 hours to settle. They need to settle and attach and start growing before they start working. That's why, you know, some people that I added a, the bacteria this morning and it's four o'clock in the afternoon and I still have ammonia. They don't work that fast, folks. So you got to give them some time thinking about it, Hillary. Probably what I would do is have, what test kit do you have and do a dilution? And I'm willing to bet in this case, the ammonia is much, much higher than two, which has slowed the whole cycle now that I think about it. Good advice. Let's see, we are on question number five. I've heard using gravel in a saltwater tank is not recommended. Is there any supplement that would offset this to allow gravel to be safely used in a saltwater tank? Thanks. Well, there's no danger in gravel. It's just the tradition has been to use some type of calcareous substance. I think the worst. Have you ever had an aquarium with oyster shell substrate? Yes, actually. No, I have as terrible. I hated it. <laughs> Uh, but but uh, calcareous, you know, um, cor coral substrate, oyster shell, something like that, they help buffer the water. Gravel doesn't, and so there. But but gravel, you gravel's not going to kill your aquarium at all. And many parts of the ocean, especially estuarine areas, they have a lot of gravel because you're washing the small gravel pellets down from the rivers that are replenishing, you know, the, the um, substrate. But what's going to happen is you may not get the buffering ability. So that's why you're going to have to use calc phosphor and maybe a calcium reactor. So the calc phosphor helps with your alkalinity and the calcium reactor helps keep your calcium. But in the reality, how much calcium dissolves from your substrate? Not too much. So 
You can use gravel safely, but you would need to be monitoring your alkalinity and your calcium and your magnesium levels. And there's plenty of different ways to do that. We've just introduced here at Vegas. We just got the container in from our uh, partners, ASF, uh, you know, France, and uh, we have our reef shots. And we have calcium, strontium, and magnesium supplements in liquid form in a very easy way to add. So, but you can use calcium. It's not toxic at all. Okay. Question number six. Hello, I'm on day five of a fishless tank cycle with live plants in the tank using your ammonia. I've struggled to keep ammonia above one, but have been following the schedule on your website. I tested tonight after adding four drops and my API test kit reads ammonia 0.5, nitrite zero, pH 6.8 to seven, and nitrate is five. I have no clue how the nitrates are so high, but I've just started my cycle. Should I just hang in there and keep following the regime or should I, or have I done something wrong? Thank you for your help. So the tank is five days old. They've added ammonia and they're worried about they have nitrates. I would say congratulations. It shows the bacteria is working. So there's nothing wrong, especially as they said, they've struggled to keep the ammonia high. Well, one, live plants like ammonia too. I mean, they'll take them, they prefer nitrate, but they'll take ammonia. So you've got nitrifying bacteria because you added the one and only. You also got plants that are using the ammonia, but having nitrate is not a problem. It's it's an indication that things are working and your tank is going through the cycle and you're doing fine. If you're going to cycle your tank with live plants in the tank, I would recommend adding less ammonia because high ammonia can actually damage, harm the plants. So cut back on that. But the the showing up of nitrate, your tank is cycling and you're well on your way to, to success. So there's there's nothing. You're not doing anything wrong. Enjoy. Yes. I love when that's the answer. <laughs> Question number seven. Hi, I added Dr. Tim's Aquatics Waste Away Talium Release Gels to my 60-gallon 60, 60 reef, and my skimmer went absolutely nuts. It just kept overflowing. Should I have turned the skimmer off to use the Waste Away Talium Release Gels? If so, how long? Uh, no, there's no reason to turn the skimmer off. The gels were developed for people that refuse to turn the skimmer off because as if you've listened to my talks, I am definitely a proponent of putting your skimmer on a timer. So you can run it with a skimmer and uh, especially a new gel, you know, you've got the gel and, the, and a new substance in there. There shouldn't be any form release or anything like that. That's cleaned out. But um you can, you can run it. You can turn it off for just a couple hours. Either way is fine. Question number eight. Can you put first defense and eco balance in an ATO reservoir if the ATO water is being pumped through a calc stir? Thank you. The water is being pumped. It doesn't return, right? I'm assuming it's being pumped. Is, is it? Yeah. I, I, it sounds like it's just being stirred in a reservoir and then... Yeah, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but you can you can put the bacteria. So this is from our coral up or color up recipe, another recipe card where you're basically, I'm going to say gut loading, but that's anthropomorphic. You're taking the vitamins in first defense, adding it to the liquid that contains the equal balance bacteria. The equal balance bacteria will assimilate those vitamins and then you dose those bacteria into your aquarium where the filter feeding corals remove those bacteria from the water. They ingest the bacteria. That's their primary source of nutrition. It's not copepods. And so then they get those vitamins and your colors come back. The chief reason your corals fade out and your tank looks dull is that you're, you, the unintended consequence of all this equipment means that you have this uh, desert of bacteria in the water. Your water's too pure and the corals aren't getting the nutrition they need. So with the color up recipe, you're adding 
vitamins to the bacteria. The bacteria are then assimilated or ingested by the corals, getting those vitamins and everybody's happy and your corals look really good. So to answer the person's question, if you're going to do this, you need to aerate or stir the mixture because when you add the first defense to a, a column, a vessel or something where you've put the equal balance bacteria, the equal balance bacteria are going to divide. And when they're dividing, they're consuming oxygen. And so you need to provide that oxygen to the environment. And what happens if you don't? Well, if you don't, after the bacteria consume all the oxygen in that vessel, then they'll go look for another electron uh, donor, and that's going to be nitrate. And if they can't find nitrate, which they probably won't find much in there, they're going to continue on and they're going to look and they're going to look for sulfate. And you've got sulfate because you've got saltwater aquarium. And what they're going to do is remember they've gone from oxygen. Now they've consumed all that, so it's anaerobic. They've consumed all the nitrate, consuming what little oxygen was left. And now the water in that vessel is anoxic. They're going to reduce the sulfate in the system to hydrogen sulfide. So you've unintentionally uh, set up a hydrogen sulfide generator. Now you're not made, paying attention because you're in a hurry and everything, and you start dosing that hydrogen sulfide water to your aquarium and everything dies. So moral of the story, if you're going to follow this recipe, yes, you need to have the system, the, the vessel aerated. If stirring it means it's aerated, that's fine, or an air stone or some water movement, but you definitely have to have some aeration and use your nose. If that vessel starts smelling like rotten eggs, clean it out, throw it away and start over again because it's gone anoxic that hydrogen, that rotten egg is hydrogen sulfide, and you do not want to put that in your aquarium. It'll kill your fish. It'll kill your corals. It'll kill your nitrifying bacteria. So follow the directions. Yes, Did absolutely. Did I just scare everybody? <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> A little bit. Sorry about that, folks. But we say aerate. We mean yes. aerate. Now you know why. <laughs> Question number nine. Hello, I'm battling a bad case of hair algae in a three-year-old tank. Is there a good case of hair algae? <laughs> no. Sorry, it's Friday. It is Friday. Do you know if I could use reef lux to kill the algae and then use waste away right after to clean up the sludge and lower the phosphates and nitrates? It's a mixed reef. Thanks in advance. Okay, what's reef lux, Hillary? Are you Googling that real quick? Yes. Okay. Um... I'll play elevator music while you're Googling. Do, do, <laughs> do, 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 do. No. Uh, while she's doing that, let me, I don't want to scare you from using this uh, color up recipe, but, but once again, more is not better. So as we say in the recipe, there is a chart, a dosing chart. Don't just squirt a bunch of one or, or a first defense in there thinking you're going to grow more bacteria. The more bacteria means they're going to suck more oxygen out, which is not what you want. So you want things in moderation. Um, and th that's the whole key to the thing. Just don't pour a bunch of first defense in there thinking it's going to... Uh... Okay, back to this question. Reflux is a fungal medicine, not effective against hair algae or other turf style algae. All right, so back, what was the question, Hillary, again? They want to know if they can use the reflux to kill the algae and then use the race waste away right afterwards to clean up the sludge, lower the phosphates and the nitrates. Well, the answer would be yes, because this a fungal medicine is not going to kill the waste away. But as we always say, the waste away bacteria feed on the dead organics. So when you've treated something, you have no idea how much dead organics you have in the system. So start out slow with the waste away. Just like I said earlier, a few seconds ago, don't overdose the first defense. Please don't overdose the waste away. You're trying to prime the pump here. You can always add a little more, you know, but, but if you just pour it in and there's a ton of organics, 
then you can get a bacterial bloom, which will suck all the oxygen out of your aquarium, and that'll kill everything. So take your time, folks. You know, as we've said a lot, nothing good happens fast in an aquarium. There's always a, a reaction which can be bad. So with the waste away, it's a powerful tool, but use it correctly. Slow. We say cut it, you know, cut it in quarters a little bit. If your water starts to turn cloudy, that's telling you that they're doing their job. They're multiplying and they're breaking down those organics, which is what you want. But it may take multiple doses over, you know, a week's period of time to get where you want. Don't try to compress that in one day or you're going to have a huge mess. I told you about the guy feeding his goldfish a fried, a boiled egg, right? <laughs> oh, is that a question that I'm jumped I, ahead? I don't see the questions, folks. <laughs> so I, don't, I, I don't have that. So let's, let's, let's make that number 10. Okay. <laughs> Are we, so well, the answer is yes. On this note. Goes, okay. So we got an email or we got contact that I, I don't know because I saw it. And the, this guy had fed his goldfish a boiled egg and then the whole tank is the water is cloudy white he can't see in it and he wants to know what's wrong so my first question was a boiled egg but this is the thing and we won't go into that and um, why you would want to feed your goldfish a boiled egg but that's out there on the internet and so is eating Tide Pods, but don't do that either. Or snorting cinnamon, don't do that either. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's something you should do. <laughs> That's my public service message for the day. So <laughs> you feed this boiled egg to a whole egg to one fish. Well, that's full of protein. You know, the, the, the yolk, just the whole thing. It's organic. It's just what I was just talking about. You've put a bunch of organic in the egg into your water. And the bacteria are like, we're in nirvana here. This is wonderful. And they're going to divide and go crazy. And most people think, you know, well, that when, once they run out, out of oxygen, they'll stop. No, they'll just keep on going. And that that's why the water is so cloudy, is that they're basically mineralizing or oxid, breaking down that organic material, the egg, and they're going to be doing this for a long time because that is a huge amount of protein and organic material. So recommendation, get the egg out. But even there, you're going to have a ton of stuff. You're going to have to clean the gravel. Basically, the recommendation is get the fish out, put it in a better, you know, water, and then change all that water and rinse the substrate, the nitrifying bacteria will be fine with a quick rinse and just, um, you know, start, kind of not start over from a nitrifying standpoint, but just get all that junk out of there. Cause this went on for a couple of days. Cause you know, just because we recommend stuff doesn't mean people follow it and uh, the water's still cloudy. Yeah. Cause you got all that organic material in there and until it's all consumed, you're going to continue to have, milky white water from feeding a boiled egg. I, I mean, no, hell, I've been in this a long time. And I've never heard feeding a boiled egg to a goldfish. Well, always learn, always learn something. I will say. Ooh, when yes. I, <laughs> <laughs> at the I'm aquarium. <laughs> no, when I was a beginner and I used to have guppies i would hard boil egg and feed little teeny tiny amounts of egg yolk to the fry because it was very high in protein but not enough to cloud my water like tiny okay. amounts tiny amounts of the yolk there's some operative words there this guy <laughs> just put the whole egg in the whole thing. because yes egg yolk and that was a secret that uh i i think this story is true I wouldn't want to be spreading rumors, would I? Uh, but, you know, people couldn't raise discus for a long, long time because, they, you know, they couldn't get the fry to feed. And it turns out that the fry nibble on the flanks of the parents. They're, they're basically eating a biofilm that's growing on the flanks of the parents. And Jack Watley 
deduce this, you know, years and years ago, if Jack Watley was the a very famous discus breeder, I don't know that he was the first, but but he was the most early in the early years. He was the most successful for sure. And the secret that didn't get out for a long, long time is that he would take egg yolk, like Tillery's talking about, cooked egg yolk, folks. Don't just crack an egg and put the yolk in your aquarium, please. But he would take that cooked egg yolk and he would smash it against the glass or some surface and the fry would feed on that. And that's how he successfully was able to rear fry. And that was his secret that people didn't know for a long, long time. So definitely that. But you said little, at least twice, maybe three times, a little bit. As I said earlier, a little bit of waste away. Dropping a whole cooked egg in your aquarium. Uh, maybe if you're raising piranhas. I don't know. But not a goldfish. I don't really see an experiment that I want to conduct here, Hillary, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of dirty water to clean. Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. As Hillary mentioned, any questions, please contact us, info at Dr. Tim's Aquatics, um, dot com, social media, all those good types of things. And um, we've got Aquashella, Arifa Palooza coming. So we've still got some shows left in uh, the year we always like uh, people coming out and talking to us and asking questions and taking pictures and stuff like that and swapping jokes yeah and swapping jokes yes <laughs> if you've got a joke come on by maybe we can do a i nope. keep waiting to see like a a tag team joke at the shows but Li live streaming on facebook or something yeah Okay, we've just invited and uh, we're going to we're going to pay for this Hillary, but it'll be good fun. So. <laughs> yes. Yes. So. The more the merrier. Yeah. We we shows are a good time. So please if you're at the sh at one of these, come on by and uh tell us your joke. We 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 always have a good time. So we're done for the day, right, Hillary? Yep, that's it. All right. So that went fast. Thanks everybody. Uh we appreciate you listening and appreciate you sending in your questions and uh, your support. So thank you very much. And this has been Dr. Tim and Hillary and another Dr. Tim's Aquatics podcast, Good Fish Keeping.